So it's May 2022 and I've had my 2020 ridge line for about a year, a little over a year now. Um, put over just over 18,000 miles on it and I figured it was time to do a one year review even though I'm a little bit late for that and you might be wondering why am I doing a one year review in spring of 2022 on a 2020 Honda Ridge Line and that's because I was able to pick this up in spring of 2021 as a leftover 2020 model. Yes, amazingly, uh, I was still able to do that at that time. That was a little bit before the pandemic insanity um, had really taken over the automotive market. Um, now you'd never be able to find such a deal. The MSRP was about 37500 I ended up leasing this truck um, and the cap cost, which is basically the equivalent of the sales price on a lease was about 34,000. So I ended up getting an amazing deal on the lease. Um, and I wanted to do a quick review here, um, give you a few good things and a few bad things about my one year experience with this truck. So here we go. All right, so I have a list here of about six good things and six bad things. Um, let's start with the good. Um, Smooth, smooth, smooth is the word for this truck. Engine, transmission, everything about this truck, smooth and quiet. I absolutely love it as a daily driver. In fact, I would say this is probably my favorite daily driver I've ever had because it's so incredibly smooth and quiet. Engine, transmission, the ZF, um, nine-speed transmission, it is just so smooth. Um, it's a pleasure to drive every day back and forth to work. I absolutely love that about this truck. The engine, in addition to being incredibly buttery smooth, sounds super wicked um, when you really put your foot into the gas and you get into the VTEC. It's a typical Honda 3.5 liter V6. They really know how to make their, their V6 engines. So um, that's probably my favorite thing about this truck. When they switched to this ZF, a nine-speed transmission, it dropped the zero to 60 time down to just over six seconds, which is amazingly the same as my Tundras were that had the 5.7 liter V8. So it's quick, especially you, you really do need to shift the transmission into sport mode if you want it to be ultra quick like that. So I don't even use that mode all that often. I usually just leave it in drive to get the better gas mileage. So smooth, smooth, smooth is the word. Uh, miles per gallon. That's another thing I've really enjoyed about this truck after driving Tundras and uh, Tacomas for many years. I have averaged um, in spring, summer, and fall about 23.5 miles per gallon. Um, and then during the winter time, it dropped down to 20.5. I would guess overall for the first year of um, driving this truck, I have averaged about 22 miles per gallon overall. I'm really happy with that, especially right now with gas prices exploding. Um, the best I ever averaged in any of my V8 Tundras was about 16 and a half miles per gallon. And then the best I ever averaged in my uh, Tacomas was about 18 uh, miles per gallon. So this has been a vast improvement over the Toyota trucks I uh, drove for many years and as far as miles per gallon goes. Another thing I like about this truck that might surprise you is the black plastic cladding that's all the way around the bottom edge of this truck. I know the black plastic cladding gets a real bad rap in the automotive industry, but I happen to really love how it protects this vehicle from salt damage and rock damage and dirt and mud here in Michigan, um, where they pour an astonishing amount of salt on the roads all winter long. I love how well protected the bottom edge of this vehicle is. I added these WeatherTech um, mud flaps aftermarket. They fit perfectly, so that is also been a nice compliment to the existing black plastic cladding. So yeah, I really, really like that about this truck. And I also happen to think it looks great with the white paint. Probably my number one feature as an outdoorsman, someone who spends an astonishing amount of time hunting and fishing, has got to be the in-bed trunk. So let me unlock the door here. I think the first thing I realized when I got this truck about the in-bed 
bed trunk was how much bigger it was in person than I thought it was after just watching YouTube videos about this truck. I got my GoPro bag in here just to give you an idea of the size of this ginormous trunk. So I hunt um, two or three, maybe even four times a week from October through December. And then I fish three or four times a week from April through October. And so I always have this in-bed trunk filled with hunting and fishing stuff. Um, it's been so nice to have this waterproof, lockable, safe storage for my hunting and fishing stuff. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult if I ever go back to a body-on-frame truck um, to give up that in-bed trunk. Of course, the dual-action tailgate is also very nice for loading and unloading. I'll show you how it works here. So nice to be able to open it either way when you're loading certain heavy things. Really nice, cool feature. Not quite as great as the in-bed trunk, but still great. And I know this is definitely an unpopular opinion, but I actually kind of like the looks of this truck. It's really grown on me over the last year. I know that um, most people believe the redesign for 2021 is a vast improvement, but I actually have grown to like the steeply sloped hood. It makes view uh, visibility from the driver's seat really, really excellent, so parking this is so much easier than any other truck I've ever driven. Um, I happen to like this color combination as well. I think it looks great with the white and black trim. Okay, on to the not so great stuff. Um, I'm pretty nitpicky, so some of this stuff some owners might not care about, but my first thing on this um, list of, of the not so great stuff is the, the ZF 9 speed transmission. It's buttery smooth, um, and I especially like the sport mode, but there is one problem with this transmission, and that is it tapes, takes absolutely forever to shift between reverse and drive and drive in reverse. I've, I've actually backed out of a few spots and had some really awkward situations while I waited for it to go from reverse into drive. So that's been a, a kind of a disappointing thing about this transmission. Could even be a safety issue in certain situations. And to go hand in hand with the uh, transmission, I really dislike the push button shifter. Um, it has not grown on me over the last year. I kind of hate it. Um, it's gimmicky. It's stupid. It, I, I really actually enjoy resting my hand on a traditional shift knob, so I really miss it. And the way these buttons are placed, they're right next to the cup holders. Probably not the smartest decision by the Honda engineers to have these buttons, which are susceptible to damage by liquids, be right next to the cup holders. Um, you do the math. I mean, it's not, not a great decision to have these buttons here. Um, I, I really don't like it, and I wish this truck had a traditional shifter. I know that they added the volume knob back for the 2021s and later, so maybe they can listen to their customers and go back to the traditional shifter as well. One other complaint I have um, is regards this sport trim, which is the entry-level trim. Um, it had an MSRP of about 37.5, like I said, and that's a lot of money for, for a truck with no power seats, no heated seats, no lights by the visor, mirrors. I mean, come on, did they say five cents per light by not putting lights next to these visor mirrors? Um, that's just a ridiculous thing that they left that off. Um, it doesn't have XM radio built in. It doesn't have heated mirrors, which is a really, really annoying thing here in in the climate of West Michigan where we have many months of snow and ice to not have heated mirrors is a huge pain in the butt. Um, very, very strange decisions to leave some of these things off this trim level. Um, yeah, it's got the whole safety suite, a uh, Honda sensing, but yet they leave off little things like, you know, lights by the visor mirrors. Very strange decision by Honda. Okay, the overall fit and finish is, it's pretty good. Um, but it definitely does not measure up to what I'm used to having driven Toyota trucks for so many years There's two particular problem areas with the fit and finish on this vehicle that I will show you First one is the trim below the back window on the inside here I'll try to give you a good view of it. You can see right there how wavy it is up down the whole length of the window 
looks really terrible. Most owners I don't think would notice such a thing, but I'm pretty nitpicky when it comes to stuff like this. And this trim just goes wavy up and down the whole length of the window. It just was not installed correctly. The other part is regarding the uh, tailgate here. I've read about this online. It's the cap on the tailgate. If you can take a look at it here and see that it's not on there correctly. It's not quite lined up. I guess uh, some people have walked through Honda lots and, and taken a look at this and um, counted like 90% of the ridge lines on a Honda lot will have this cap not lined up. You can see it really good right there. It just was not installed quite correctly. It's on there nice and solid. It's not gonna fall off, but it's not lined up at all. Kind of annoying. A lot of the interior um, has pretty good fit and finish. The panel gaps are pretty good. Um, not, not quite what I'm used to with my Toyota trucks, which clearly had better fit and finish overall. One issue I have here is my first warranty claim, uh, which isn't bad after over a year of ownership and over 18,000 miles, and that is I've got some water in the tail light here. You can see I've gone through a car wash today and. Uh, there's quite a bit of water in there, so they're going to replace that under warranty. That's the only warranty claim I've had in a year of um, ownership. But that brings me to the uh, last thing on my not-so-great list, and that is the maintenance. So Honda doesn't have any free maintenance, unlike Toyota and Jeep and other manufacturers. You have to pay for it all yourself. Um, oil changes and tire rotations I've done too, and those were only about 75 bucks. But I found out that the very cool trick rear differential in this vehicle, the torque vectoring system, requires that the fluid be changed at 15,000 miles and every 30,000 miles thereafter at a cost of $130. Um, that's pretty disappointing when I've gotten used to two years free maintenance when you know, I'm driving the Toyota truck. So it's pretty disappointing. I wish Honda would also go to a couple years free maintenance the way Jeep and Toyota and other manufacturers have. But the worst maintenance issue is the fact that Honda is one of the last manufacturers still using a timing belt engine. Um, so although I love this engine, it's super super smooth, smooth, buttery. It does require you to budget a thousand dollars or more um, every hundred thousand miles or so to replace the timing belt. Not so sure I'll be keeping this long term, but for those who do, it's something really to keep in mind if you're comparing this to a Toyota especially. So my overall grade, I guess, after driving it for a year, I would give it a B plus. It's a great daily driver, one of the best I've ever had. Maybe my favorite daily driver I've ever had. Gets very good gas mileage for a truck. The in-bed trunk and the dual action tailgate make it incredibly practical for me as a hunter and fisherman. It's not great off-road. Um, doesn't have very good ground clearance, so there have been a handful of times when I did not go to a specific hard to reach hunting or fishing or camping spot because I didn't think this would make it. If there's a negative, it's that. And if there's a place where my Toyota trucks beat this truck, it's, it's in the off-road capability. But I usually get my off-road kicks riding my dual sport Kawasaki KLX 300 motorcycle, so I don't really need this to do off-roading. Um, but there is about, I'd say, 3% of the time when I miss my Toyota trucks because of their superior off-road capability. But as a daily driver, which is, you know, most of the time, and just going to and from hunting and fishing spots, this is definitely better than those trucks most of the time. I don't know if I'll switch back to a Toyota. I'm definitely gonna buy this at the end of the lease because I can buy it for six, 7,000 less than what it's worth because of the pandemic. So I'll definitely be buying it, but maybe I will sell it for a nice fat profit and put that money down on a Tacoma or a Nissan Frontier. I, I haven't decided for sure yet. This is superior to those trucks as a daily driver, but I like the looks of those trucks. They have a better cool factor and they're definitely better off-road um, for you know, getting me to hard to reach hunting and fishing and camping spots. So the jury's still out on the, my long-term decision on this truck, but after about a year of ownership, a little over 18,000 miles, I'll give it a B plus. Thanks for watching.